Tonight will be our last study in the book of Job, where we cover chapters 40, 41, and 42. And uh, it, it really hasn't been all that many weeks that we've been meeting together to go through this book. But it seems like a long time ago that we were in Job chapter 1 and saw this blameless and upright man who was plunged into catastrophe because of a focus upon him behind the, the, the curtain that separates heaven and earth up in the heavenly realm between Satan and God. There was a heavenly controversy over this godly man, Job. Satan believed that Job served God only for the blessings that God gave him. And he believed that if he were to be allowed to take those blessings away, then Job would not only stop serving God, he would in fact curse God. And so to vindicate God's good name and to vindicate his own servant Job and thereby teach these angelic beings a lesson through Job's example, God allowed Satan to bring some measure of catastrophe in Job's life. And we've talked about this in previous studies, how Job in one afternoon, he lost all of his wealth financially. He was a very rich man, and he went to, to having nothing in just one afternoon. But much worse than that, of course, his 10 children perished. But that wasn't the end of his losses. Later on, he lost his own health. His health what was was very important to any person, right? It's, 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 it's obviously something that you just live with. And you, you take for granted when you have good health. But when your health is bad, oh, you're very aware of the affliction in your life. And this was it was for Job. Job fell under some very painful and long-lasting affliction that seemed to stick with him for months. And then he lost the support of his godly wife. We take it that his wife was a godly woman. But she sure didn't seem that way. Not, not when she told Job to curse God and die. Job lost the support of his friends because all of his friends turned against him. And in chapter after chapter, Job's friends debate back and forth with him, trying to persuade him that, that the real cause of his problem is some hidden, unconfessed sin in Job's life. And if Job would only confess this sin, then God could begin to restore him and put it all right. But in the proper integrity of his heart, Job knew that that was not the cause. And it was not indeed, because the Bible tells us that he was a blameless and upright man. And it shows us what the reason was for this calamity that came upon Job. The, the, this thing that happened in the invisible realm of the heavenlies. Not something that could be figured out on a human level. And in the midst of all of that, Job held on to his integrity, even though he lost the support of his friends. But then finally, the greatest loss that Job suffered was not his wealth, not his children, not the support of his wife, not, not, not the friendship and the support of his friends. The very worst thing that Job suffered was the, the distance he felt between himself and God. He felt that God was utterly absent from his situation. He felt that God had abandoned him in his time of greatest need. Well, we went through chapter after chapter after chapter where Job cries out to his friends and they answer him back and try to persuade him that he's a sinner. And where Job uh, again and again protests his innocence, but yet at the same time he cries out to God, complaining of his affliction all the way up until we saw it last week, where in Job chapter 38, finally God comes and speaks to Job in the midst of a storm. And he, he has a very interesting time with Job in chapters 38 and 39. He has almost a and I hope I'm describing this reverently. He has almost a playful time with Job. Where he shows Job the greatness of God's wisdom. And in some sense, the smallness of Job's understanding. But he doesn't do it in a harsh or heavy way. He does it in almost a fun way. By showing Job the majesty and the absurdity of the natural creation. Well, God's not finished in this conversation with Job. And that's where we pick it up here in chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. You see, this continued God's challenge to Job, where God answered Job's heart without specifically answering Job's 
questions. This came after what we saw in our previous study in Job chapters 38 and 39, where Job had an extended time of fellowship and learning and wonder and teaching from God. But now God is trying to put Job in the proper frame of mind once again. And he says, did you see it there in verse 2? Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? You see, Job, as we saw many times previously in the book, he spoke from what he felt to be his God-absent agony. And when he spoke from what he felt was his God-absent agony, he longed for God to contend with him. Yet after God appeared to him in his love and in his glory, Job now felt humbled about his previous demand. He rightly felt that he had no place to contend with the Almighty, much less to correct him or rebuke him. Let me put it to you this way. I think we might say that Job and God had a wonderful time together in Job chapters 38 and 39. And God taught Job all about his greatness. And he used the whole world as his classroom. Yet in it all, God remained God and man remained man. And after all of that, he says, Job, are you going to contend with me? Are you still going to battle back and forth with me as you insisted on doing before? And look at Job's reply here, starting at verse 3. Now, this is Job's first words since the dramatic revelation of God, right? Verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. You see, After all of this dramatic revelation, after all of this invitation from God that we just read in the first two verses, now, Job, do you want to contend with me? Then Job answered the Lord. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? We finally come to this point in the book of Job. Job had prayed often throughout these dialogues that he had with his friends. And he was the only one of the five ever to speak to God between his four friends and himself. Yet now Job spoke to God after God revealed himself, and he speaks with an entirely different tone than he had before. Remember how Job spoke with God before? God, where are you? Why are you treating me like this? And then once God reveals himself, what is it? Behold, I am vile. With what shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I have nothing to say. Now, I want you to notice, had anything changed in Job's circumstances? Was he still poor? Were his children still dead? Was his wife still unsupportive? Was he still covered with painful sores? Although nothing had changed in Job's circumstances. But what had changed? What had changed was that once he had felt that God had forsaken him, now he felt and knew that God was with him. And that changed everything, right? Don't you think it's very uh, unbelievable to see here that that, that Job's whole attitude changes completely, even though his circumstances had not changed at all. What he had received was a revelation of God in the midst of his crisis. I want you to notice, too, that Job also spoke with a completely different tone than he had before with his companions. Now he doesn't give what he had given before to his friends. Remember, Job could get pretty eloquent, right? Long speeches, sometimes getting right in his friend's face, sometimes accusing them of being stupid or cruel or whatever it was. You know, Job would really give it to him. Now what does he say? He says, not much. I just want to cover my, my, my mouth with my hand. I have nothing to say. You see, it's as if the master has now come and the servant who had contended with the fellow servants takes a lowly place of silence and humility because now the master is present. And he says, you saw it there in verse four, didn't you? Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? You see, in Job chapter 31, Job once wanted to question God with great passion. As a matter of fact, in chapter 31, he demanded to be brought into God's court. God, you know, come on now, uh, let's get this thing settled. I call you into court, God, you'll bring your case against me. But now, 
after the revelation of God and the restoration of Job's sense of fellowship with him, Job sensed his own relative position before God that he could not answer God. And so he says, behold, I am vile. Now, do you know what the word vile means? Vile means horrible. It means a horrible person. It's as if Job is saying, behold, I am horrible. Is that a good translation or a bad translation? Well, it depends. The, the, the word in its original context of more Victorian or Elizabethan English actually had the idea of something that had no weight. That's what Job is saying. What he's literally saying is, behold, I am nothing. I'm light. God, you're, you know, as heavy as an elephant. I'm light like a feather. Behold, I'm nothing, God. And Job wasn't saying that he was horrible so much, actually, as he was saying that he was nothing. You see, he he understands that when he comes near to God, even though if you were to measure Job on a scale with other people, he would be the heavy one, right? He would be the one with the weight of glory upon him. But compared to God's weight of glory, he's like a feather. And what does he say there? I like what Spurgeon pointed about, out about this in verse 4. He says, behold, I am vile. And he says that word behold implies that he was astonished. The discovery was unexpected. There are times when the Lord's people, when they learn by experience that they are vile. You know what I think is amazing about this? Isn't this exactly what Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu had been working so hard to get Job to say for so many chapters? Didn't they want him to say that? You see, all the arguing of those four men could not bring Job to this place. Only the revelation of God could do so. And it could humble Job and put him in his right place before the Lord. You you see, Job made his strong and sometimes outrageous statements when he felt to the core of his soul that God had forsaken him. But now, with the sense of the presence of the Lord restored within him, Job could much better see his proper place before God. Now, again, it's important to say that God never did forsake Job. We understand that, don't we? God never forsook Job. Yet, that time, there was a period of time, I should say, when he withdrew the sense of his presence. And this was a source of profound misery to Job. God was present with Job all along, strengthening him with his unseen hand. Job could have never survived this ordeal without that unseen, unsensed hand of God supporting him. Now, to bring Job to this place where he says, I'm nothing, I abhor myself. To bring Job to that place, we do not need to think that God was angry and harsh with Job in chapters 38 and 39. It's still entirely possible. I think even likely that God's manner with Job in those chapters was marked by a warm and loving fellowship more than harsh rebuke. In other words, when God met with Job in chapters 38 and 39, and right here at the beginning of chapter 40, it wasn't him grabbing Job by his collar and shaking him around saying, don't you understand that you're just a little man before me? I'm a great God. It wasn't like that. It was instead God showing him his grandeur and his greatness in what I believe to be the most loving and warm way. And Job getting the point all by himself, God, you're so big and I'm so small. Don't ever forget what it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. And I think that it was a remarkable outpouring of God's love and warmth and fellowship with Job that brought him to this place. The place where Job would say, as he says in verse 4, I lay my hand over my mouth. Job was now ashamed at the way he had spoken about God in his previous situation. Oh God, I felt like I spoke as if you had forsaken me, but now I see you would never forsake me. Now I see how great you really are. I'm just going to shut up, God. I'm going to use my hand, and I'm going to stop my mouth, and I'm going to proceed no further, as he says there in verse 5. It's funny. It's a very common gesture, isn't it? It's a, it's a 
It's an act of total submission. I'm not saying anything. I'm covering my mouth. I have nothing more to say. Well, you wonder, does this end the story now? You say, well, wait a minute. God, you never answered Job's questions. You, you never explained to him why. Here was this man crying out, God, explain, justify me, do something. And God has never explained anything yet. Maybe he will as we go on. Let's take a look. Verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Right? The storm is still going on. He answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And God was still present with Job in the center of this strong, untamable storm. God had not morphed into a kinder, gentler sort of presence. And he says to Job, now you prepare yourself like a man. I'm going to question you and you shall answer me. That's the same phrasing with which God began the encounter. Right way back at Genesis chapter 38, verse 3, God indicated to Job by this, he was not yet finished. There's more to show you, Job, from creation. Job, I'm not finished. Let, let, let's turn back on the, the, the animal planet, so to speak, on the television. I'm going to show you some more of my majesty from creation. Verse 8. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like his? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the wrath of the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Back at verse 8, God really puts his finger on something before Job. Job, would you condemn me that you may be justified? You see, throughout Job's questioning of God, it could be said that he seemed more concerned with the defense of his own integrity rather than God's integrity. And this was natural because Job's integrity was under harsh attack, but it was not good. You see, we might say that Job fell into the trap of thinking that because he couldn't figure God out, then maybe God wasn't fair. Don't we have that tendency? If I can't figure out what God's doing, then he must not be fair. Yet in this larger section of God's revelation to Job, God demonstrates to Job, Job, you know what? There's a lot of things you don't know. And therefore, you are not fit to judge my ways. God, God explains to Job, you're not fit to determine when I'm being fair and when I'm not. As he says there in verse 9, have you an arm like God? God here is reminding Job again of the distance between himself and Job. Yes, the sense of fellowship had been restored to Job, but it did not mean that God and Job were on the same level. There was still the distance that exists between God and man. And then he says in verse 10, then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor. And in verse 11, look on everyone who is proud and humble him. And then in verse 12, tread down the wicked in their place. God challenged Job to do these things that only God can do. You see, as Job recognized his inability to do these things, it reminded him of his proper place before God. Verse 14, then God says, then will I also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. You see, with this, God strongly brought the point to Job. Since he could not do these things that only God could do, as described before in chapter 40, neither could he save himself with his own right hand. This is a beautiful message that God is trying to give to Job. In some ways, this is almost the summit of what God is trying to say to Job. Job, you can't save yourself. Salvation belongs to the Lord. No man can save his own soul by works of righteousness, which he's done or possibly even could do. No, Job, you cannot save yourself. 
They're lovingly designed, these words are, to shake Job's spirit into realizing that God is the only creator and the only savior that he can have. And then it, 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 to bring the point home even more strongly, he's going to show Job again by bringing forth another one of God's creatures before him uh, of how strong God is and how weak Job is by bringing the, 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 the concept or the, the, the animal behemoth before Job. Look at verse 15. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree, in coverts of reeds and marshes. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He's confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. Now, in chapters 38 and 39, God gave Job a very remarkable survey of the wonders of creation. But now lastly, God gives Job a look at two other remarkable creatures. Here, we just read about Behemoth, and then we read about Leviathan in Job 41. Now, the precise identity of this animal, Behemoth, is debated. Most scholars believe that what God has in mind here is what we would call the hippopotamus. It's one of the largest, strongest, and most dangerous land creatures in the world. What does he do here? Verse 15, he eats grass like an ox. His power is in his stomach muscles. God almost seems to rejoice in the power of his own creation as he describes the wonder of this amazing animal. It's as if he's showing Job this mighty hippopotamus, you know, going through the river. He goes, listen, look at that animal. I made that thing. Isn't it great? Isn't it cool to look at? But the idea is pretty clear here. If Job can't contend with this fellow creature, how could he ever contend with the God who created it? Job, if you think you can mess around with me, why don't you go master the behemoth, the hippopotamus first? But I can't do that, Job says. Well, then you also can't mess with the guy who created the behemoth. But he's not done. Now we get another look at an amazing creature, the Leviathan. Job chapter 41, starting at verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Or will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? You see, after the discussion of Behemoth in the previous chapter, now God calls Job to consider another fearful monster, this one known as Leviathan. Now, this creature was mentioned way back in Job chapter 3, verse 8. And Job, in that context, considered how sailors and fishermen would curse the threatening Leviathan. And with the same passion that sailors and fishermen cursed Leviathan, with that same passion, Job cursed the day of his birth. Now, usually, Leviathan is considered to be a mythical sea monster or dragon that terrorized sailors and fishermen. Yet in the context of Job chapter 41, God does not seem to consider Leviathan to be mythical at all. Some people believe that Leviathan describes some ancient dragon-like dinosaur that either survived to Job's day or it survived just in the collective memory of mankind so that God could refer to it as an example. Other people consider that in this context, Leviathan may be nothing more than just a mighty crocodile. I go more with the sort of dinosaur-like dragon theory because that's what it seems to be describing to my mind. The name Leviathan means twisting one 
and it's used in several other interesting places in the scriptures. Uh, Psalm 74, verses 12 through 14, describes Leviathan as a sea serpent, one that God broke the head of long ago, perhaps at creation. Psalm 104, verse 26, refers to Leviathan as a sea creature. Uh, Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, speaks of the future defeat of Leviathan, also associating it with a twisting serpent that lives in the sea. Uh, Isaiah 51 and Psalm 89 also speak of a serpent associated with the sea that God defeated as a demonstration of his great strength. It identifies that, that serpent with a name. The name is Rahab. Do you know what the name Rahab means? Proud one. And then in Job 26, it also refers to God's piercing defeat of a fleeing serpent associated with the sea. When you put all of this together, what do you have? You have this picture of God doing battle with his dragon-like, serpent-like, uh, proud, twisting, evading creature that's resisting him, which seems in some ways to be a picture or symbol of Satan himself. It's very interesting. Because we know that later on, in the book of Revelation, when Satan is represented by a creature, what is he represented as? A dragon. I think this imagery is somewhat consistent throughout the scriptures. And so I want you to consider that it may very well be that God is referring to a creature that Job might have either known by his own experience or heard of in the collective memory of mankind, some dragon sort of creature. But God is also making a reference here in a secondary sense to Satan himself. And we'll see this later on in the chapter. But right here at verse 2, we see the challenge that God made to Job. Can you put a reed through his nose or per pierce his jaw with a hook? God's point with his whole description of Leviathan is to show Job just how powerless he is against this creature. There's nothing that Job can do against this mighty monster. And this makes the association between Leviathan, which was obviously some dragon-type creature, even if it is in this context uh, only a mighty crocodile, it makes that connection between Leviathan and Satan even more interesting. Leviathan may very well be, as I said before, another serpent-like manifestation of Satan. And by the way, doesn't this suggest something to us here? In this very last chapter, well, 42 comes after this, but the, at the very end of the book of Job, what do we find? God holding up Job and telling him, contend against Satan and see what you can do. And how did the book of Job begin? with Job contending against Satan. And even as Job was powerless against Leviathan, as all men are, so Job was powerless against an unleashed Satan set against him. Who could defeat Leviathan? God. Who could defeat Satan? God. Satan may here be typified by Leviathan, and the question to Job is, can you take him on? And Job says, no way, God, you have to do it for me. Now, verse 8, lay your hand on him. Remember the battle, never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall not one be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. Did you see that in verse 9? Any hope of overcoming him is false. Job, you cannot hope to defeat Leviathan. It is simply beyond your power to do so. Therefore, verse 10, who then is able to stand against me? The logical point is made. If Job can't contend with Leviathan or with Satan, who is represented by Leviathan, how could he ever hope to stand against the God who made Leviathan and masters Leviathan? This was another very effective way of setting Job in his proper place before God. But there's a secondary point here. What's that? That God himself is the master over Leviathan. Did you see what he says there in verse 11? Everything under heaven is mine. Even you, Leviathan. Even you, Satan. 
You see, by telling of his dominion over Behemoth, over Leviathan, the Lord is illustrating what he already said back in chapter 40, that, that he is God and he has authority over everything. Now he goes on to continue to describe Leviathan. Look here at verse 12. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty powers, graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. God says here in verse 12, I'll not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, his graceful proportions. To strengthen the point he made in the previous section, the point that Job cannot stand against Leviathan, therefore he cannot hope to stand against God, now God will describe in greater detail the might and the glory of this creature. So in verse 13, he says, who can remove his outer coat? Verse 14, he has terrible rows of teeth all around, rows of scales. Verse 17, joined one to another. You see, this description of Leviathan, especially with the rough, armor-like, scaly skin and terrible teeth all around, makes some people think that what Levi whatever Leviathan is in this biblical and mythological context, they, they think that what God had in mind right here was a mighty crocodile. Well, I don't know for sure, but I can say that, that, that if nothing, it points back to some dragon-like manifestation of Satan. He goes on to describe right here, verse 18, his sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning ashes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Now, this description of Viathan seems to definitely go beyond a crocodile, doesn't it? I've never seen a fire-breathing crocodile. It sure seems to be describing some dinosaurish, dragon-like creature. In verse 20, smoke goes out of his nostrils. A flame goes out of his mouth. This description of Leviathan seems much more like what we would think of as a dragon. And curiously, the dragon motif is common across cultures and lands and may very well point to the existence of some creature of this type in prehistory. It may be to this common memory of a fire-breathing reptilian creature that God refers. I mean, isn't it strange that, that the ancient Indians in America w would have representations of a dragon? A and the Chinese would. A and the early Europeans and Vikings would. And all these diverse cultures all over the... Why should they have this image common as a motif? Probably because there actually really was one. And in some sense, this representation of Satan. Verse 22, strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him and cannot be moved. His heart is hard as stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid because of his crashings. They're beside themselves. Though sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones become slow like stubble to him. Darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threat of javelins. His undersides are like sharp pot sherds. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. He makes the deep a boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think that the deep had white hair. On earth there's nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Now, do you remember that I said that later on in the chapter, you're going to see the description of this dragon-like creature, Leviathan, sound more and more like Satan? Well, here it is. You see, in verse 22, it says, Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. In this last extended section of Leviathan, God spoke in terms that more closely connect the concept of Leviathan with Satan. It could be said of Satan, as well as Leviathan, many different things. You could say, well, what? Strength dwells in his neck? They're strong, right? Leviathan's strong, Satan's strong. 
You could say that they are cruel and entertained by sorrow. Verse 22, sorrow dances before him. What a very strong poetic description, isn't that? You could say both of them, as it is in verse 23, that they are strongly defended. The folds of his flesh are joined together. They're firm on him and cannot be moved. Isn't Satan strongly defended? Yes, he is. Verse 24, they are unsympathetic and hard of heart. His heart is as hard as stone. Verse 25, they cause the mighty to fear. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. It's true of Leviathan. It's true of Satan. Verse 26, they cannot be successfully attacked, where it says, though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail. And then in verse 29, he laughs at the threat of javelins. As it says in verse 30, they have very few vulnerable spots. His undersides are like sharp potsherds. And then in verse 33, they have no worthy adversaries on earth. On earth, there is nothing like him. Now that's true of Satan, and it's true of, of uh, Leviathan. And then finally, as you saw it right there in verse 34, they are filled with pride. He is king over children of all the earth. That's very interesting. We find that Satan is not dealt with directly in the book of Job after chapter 2. After the second challenge where he took away Job's health and afflicted him with that grievous disease, you don't seem to see another word of Satan except in this backhanded way right here in chapter 41. See, God deals with Satan in the form of Leviathan, describing him to Job with the same sort of picture language that he later uses in the book of Revelation with this final description, especially there in verse 34, he is king over all the children of pride. This description of Leviathan, especially at this point, is so like that of Satan that we may fairly suppose that God was indicating to Job not only his great might and Job's great vulnerability before Satan, but he may very well have been alluding to Satan's role in Job's great crisis. See, remember I told you that God gives Job no answers here at the end of the book. And it's true. But you might say he's giving him a hint here, right? Job, I'm not going to tell you why all this stuff happened to you. But let me tell you about Leviathan and why you need me to shelter you against Leviathan. It's a hint. It's not an explanation. God never says, well, you know, one day I was just bragging about you and then Satan and I got in this controversy. That's explain all that stuff that we read in Job chapters 1 and 2. But the way that he brings forth Satan before Job in the sense of Leviathan, God may very well have been hinting to the idea, Job, there is a reason why you were attacked so severely. It's because Leviathan, it was because Satan, th th this desperate, proud dragon, was let loose upon you. You see, Job called God to consider, excuse me, God called Job. Let me make sure I reverse that. God called Job to consider these unconquerable beasts who each in their own way were examples of Satan and his power. He allowed Job to consider the fact that he could not stand before the power of Satan without God empowering him. See, what was tormenting Job most of all throughout his whole ordeal? The feeling that he was alone. And you know what God was telling him? Job. If you were really alone, Leviathan would have eaten you up a long time ago. Job, if you were really alone, you could have never survived it because only I can take on Leviathan. Only I can take on Satan. And the fact that you have survived this ordeal at all shows that I was with you all along, holding you up with my invisible hand. It was God's way of showing him that he was not alone because if he were, he would have surely crumbled before the power of Leviathan. I like what one commentator says. His name is Mike Mason. He says, Jonah was swallowed by a whale, but the believer in Jesus Christ swallows the whale. He says, we eat Leviathan for breakfast. 
It takes a very big God and a very big faith in God to be able to absorb so much evil. Leviathan seems endlessly sprawling, gargantuan, invincible, but the essence of the gospel is that the love of God is greater than any evil. We read this description of Leviathan, and we can get all frightened of Satan and his incredible power. But instead, what should we be? We should be more amazed at the God who can control Leviathan and find our refuge in him. At the end here at chapter 41, this basically ends the words of God to Job, basically. And can I just remind you, God ends his words to Job without ever telling him the story behind the story. Job was left ignorant about the contest between God and Satan that prompted the whole crisis. Perhaps God later told him. We can't say for sure, right? But at the end of the book, Job doesn't know. He doesn't know what you and I know from Job chapters 1 and 2. Though Job did not know the whole story, what did God end with in speaking to Job about God's great victory over Leviathan slash Satan? giving Job assurance for the past, the present, and for the future. And I have to tell you, I think it was very important that God did not tell Job the reasons why he suffered what he suffered. Because then Job can be a continuing comfort and inspiration and an example for those of us who have to suffer with an explanation, without an explanation, I'd say. But once again, we emphasize this, don't we? That if God would have explained it all to Job, then you and I, in our seasons of suffering, would come to God and say, all right, God, you better explain it to me, just like you did to Job. And instead, he leaves Job without an explanation, just with the assurance of his victory and the sense of his presence and fellowship once again. All right, do you like good stories? Do you like the fairy tales when they end happily ever after? That's chapter 42. Except it's no fairy tale. It's a real story. Verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've uttered words that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Isn't that beautiful in verse 2? I know that you can do everything. You know what I love? I think Job got the point exactly when God was being like a great, loving, heavenly father, showing him the glory of all the universe and his power in both the mighty and majestic things and the strong things and the absurd things like the ostrich, right? Throughout all of that, he shows him everything. And now Job comes and just like you would see a two-year-old say to his father, I know you can do everything. That's how Job is. Oh, Lord, you really can. This wonderful statement of Job was obviously connected to the impressive display of the power and might of God over creation, but it's also connected to the comfort that the sense of the presence of God brought to Job. God, I know you can do everything You can comfort my soul even when I don't have all the answers. Now, that's really doing everything, right? It might be easier to tame Leviathan than to have that. God, you can do it. You can comfort my soul even when I don't understand what's going on. And then verse 2, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You know, the God who can master Behemoth and Leviathan can also accomplish every single purpose in Job's life, including the mysterious meanings behind the twists and turns that Job cannot see. And so Job has to confess in verse 3, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Let's face it. Job said many sad and imprudent things, both in his agonized cry way back in Job chapter 3 and in the bitter and contentious debate that he had with his friends. At times, Job doubted the very goodness of God and his righteous judgment in the world. And then at other times, he doubted if there was any good in this life or in the world beyond. Now Job has come full circle. He's back to a place of humble contentment with not knowing and with not knowing the answers to these questions that were brought about by his crisis and his companions. 
Uh, I like Job's thinking here. It's very powerfully expressed. You know what? Keep your finger there in Job chapter 42. I want you to turn over to Psalm 131. I, I think Job uh, expresses this frame of mind beautifully, or the psalmist expresses Job's frame of mind beautifully. But let's just read it. It's a very short psalm. It's one of the shortest psalms in the Bible. Uh, psalm 131, where we read, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. God, I'm done asking questions. I'm satisfied in you. Don't you see that that's where Job's at? The same place the psalmist was at? And so after that sense of confession and satisfaction, Job's not done. Look at verse 4. He says, listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, before Job seemed to want to confront God, especially in Job chapter 31, or in probably the most dramatic way at the ending of the statement, God, bring your case against me. I'll meet you in court, God. And now he says, listen, please, and let me speak. You see the difference? After the wonderful revelation of God, he respectfully asks God for the right to speak. Then he says in verse 5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. This reminds us of the most powerful aspect of Job's encounter with God. It was not primarily what God said, but it was simply God's loving, powerful presence with Job that changed him the most profoundly. You see, seeing God, not with his literal eye, but in a way literally real, it gave Job what he so wanted. It gave Job the knowledge that God was with him in the crisis, and that wonderful presence of God humbled Job. Now listen, when Job says this, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you, we should not assume that what Job knew of God before was necessarily false. Yet each fresh and deeper revelation of God has a brightness that makes our previous experience of God seem rather pale. What he had just experienced of God was so real that it made the previous experiences of God seem unreal. And so he says in verse 6, very logically, Therefore I abhor myself. You see, it's important to understand each phrase of this statement of Job's. This would seem to be the normal conviction of sin that even a saint like Job experiences in the presence of God. Yet there's good evidence that Job, with this statement, was really taking back or retracting his previous statements that he made in ignorance. Many good translators approach this verse, I abhor myself, with really, I despise myself, or... I reject what I said before. Uh, Morgan says this, the Hebrew word literally means from the standpoint of etymology, it means to disappear. From the standpoint of usage, it means to retract or to repudiate. As a matter of fact, Job went to this point, went beyond what he had previously said when he declared, I'm a small account. And at this point, he practically canceled himself entirely. He said, I take back everything I said before, God. That's what he's saying. Okay, God, I take it all back. I'm sorry. And I repent in dust and ashes. You know, it was right for Job to repent. Now, If you read this the wrong way, You read this the wrong way. You see Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu dancing up and down when Job says this. Woohoo! He repented. Ha ha, Job. Knew you were wrong all along. Glad you finally repented. Glad you listened to God. No, no, no. That's reading it completely wrong. Job had done nothing wrong to invite the crisis that came upon him. 
The reasons for that crisis were rooted in the contest between God and Satan that's recorded in the first two chapters of the book of Job. Yet Job did have to repent of his bad words and bad attitude after the crisis. He had to repent of excessively giving in to despair in Job chapter 3 and for his unwise and, and intemperate speech as he contended with his companions. It's very important for us to see this, that Job did not give in to his friends and admit that they had been right all along. That simply was not true. The sins that Job repented of were both general sins common to all men, which seemed darker now that he was in the bright presence of God, but they were also sins committed after the catastrophe came. What specifically did Job have to repent of? You know, Charles Spurgeon, in his sermon, Job Among the Ashes, he suggested several things. He said, first of all, Job repented of the terrible curse that he had pronounced on the day of his birth. That was in chapter 3. Also in chapter 3, Job had to repent of his desire to die. Job had to repent of his complaints against and challenges to God. Job had to repent of his despair. Job had to repent that his statements had been a darkening of wisdom without, by words without knowledge, that he spoke beyond his wisdom and ability to know. You see, one might say that Job's words here, these words of humble repentance and submission before God, these were words that come from the godly and not from the wicked. These words contain no curse of God whatsoever. These words ended the contest between God and Satan. These words demonstrated that the victory belonged to God alone and not to Satan at all. This was where Satan finally, completely lost everything. Where Job was humbly submitted before God, asking repentance for the relatively small sins that he had committed and not cursing God in the slightest. God's confidence in Job's faith here was completely vindicated. I like what one commentator named Anderson says about this. This is what he says. I'm quoting him now. Job is vindicated in a faith in God's goodness that has survived terrible deprivation and indeed grown in scope, unsupported by Israel's historical creed or the mighty acts of God, unsupported by life in the covenant community, unsupported by cult institutions, unsupported by the revealed knowledge from the prophets, unsupported by tradition and contradicted by experiences. Do you understand what he's saying there? Job held to his firm faith in God without the law of Moses, without a Bible to read, without a temple to go to, without an altar or a tabernacle to make sacrifices at, without a community of believers around him to support him, without the revelation of the prophets, without all of those things that help us so mightily in our faith, Job held to his faith. And that's why Anderson says at the end of this quote, next to Jesus, Job must surely be the greatest believer in the whole Bible. And I would suggest to you that that's true. When you consider what Job had to work with, his faith is astounding. Simply put, without anger towards Job, God allowed Job to suffer in order to humiliate Satan and be, to be proved to support countless sufferers who would later follow in Job's footsteps. This was now accomplished. You could say the story's over right there at verse 6. You ready now for the happily ever after? Verse 7. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went out and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. Oh, sweet vindication, right? 
lest anybody think that this repentance matter of Job's, so beautiful, so powerful, so sincere in the first few verses of this chapter, lest anybody think that that was somehow saying that Job's friends were right. God says, all right, I'm done talking to Job. Now you three friends, let me talk to you. And he confronts them. Do you see what he said in verse 7 to the friends? My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. God rebuked Job's three companions, addressing Eliphaz as their head. He was the first one of the three to speak, so he was probably the leader among the three. Now, curiously, right? Curiously, who is not addressed here? Elihu, right? And Elihu is not addressed by God in this final chapter. And some people think it was because Elihu was correct in what he said, and he was indeed God's messengers to Job. If you were with me for the Elihu study, you know what I think about that theory. I think it stinks. Mm -hmm. I think God didn't say a word to Elihu as the ultimate insult. I think taking into account exactly what Elihu said, it's better to think that God did not answer him as a way of dismissing him altogether. And Elihu, <laughs> I got nothing to say to you. My punishment to you is to ignore you completely. But this is what he says to the three friends. Verse 7, you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. The friends of Job spoke many general principles that in their setting have great wisdom. The problem was that in Job's circumstances, the wisdom didn't apply. They presented God as angry and judgmental against Job when he was not, and that displeased God. Now, might I say, this should be very sobering to us. It displeased God so much that he specifically repeated the charge again in verse 8, after he once said it in verse 7. And he commanded them to make an offering, to make atonement for their sin, and he commanded them to humble themselves and to make Job pray for them. Now again, doesn't this sort of wake us up? It is a grievous thing to present God as being angry at somebody when he is not. And that's a power that we have, don't we? How often do we present God as being angry at somebody when he's not angry? God was not pleased when Job's three friends did that. And I can imagine that the three friends were quite surprised by all this. They no doubt thought that God was in agreement with them all along. You know, when God's showing them all the things about, the, you know, the, the animals and the creation and Leviathan and all this, and then Job repents, they're probably thinking, yeah, good. You know, God, we're glad you finally got through them because, you know, we've been trying all this time. And then, whoa, we weren't right either. And by the way, God's rebuke of a life as Bildad and Zophar was at the same time an explicit vindication of Job. It's true that in his frustration and his stubbornness and his misery, Job said many things that he had to repent of, yet God still said of him, did you notice what he said? As my servant has. Job is still an example of someone who serves God. Now, you know, there's a nice ending to this. So look at verse 9. So Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. The, the, the friends of Job were accepted for Job's sake because the Lord had accepted Job. God made Job a mediator to his friends. That was humbling and instructive for the friends, but it was a happy and healing experience for Job. And the friends did it. You know, they didn't say, wait a minute, I'm not going to Job, forget it. If I got to go through Job, I'm not going at all. They said, nope, we better get right with God. Well, we were wrong. You know, I give Job's friends a lot of credit for that, right? They didn't storm off angry. Well, I'm never going to, if that's God, I don't want any part of this. No, okay, we'll do it, God. If that's what you say to do, we'll do it gladly. And Spurgeon says that Job was permitted to take a noble revenge. I like that. Well, verse 10. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Then all his brothers and sisters and those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Didn't like that. Verse 10. 
the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. You know, God was good enough to restore Job's wealth to him. Might I say, even though Job never asked for it. Did you notice that? Not once. Not once did Job ask for it. Job's agony was always much more rooted in the more spiritual aspects of his crisis, much more than the material. Yet once the spiritual issues were resolved, God restored the material things. I like the margin reading in the New King James Version, and and it's in the Old King James Version as well. It can also be translated, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. And that's a very suggestive phrase. Because the act of praying for his friends and restoring his relationship with them, in a sense, freed Job from captivity. All the anger, all the resentment that he had built up towards his friend, it it sort of kept Job as a captive. And when he prayed for them and when things were restored, he was released from that captivity. It doesn't say that God turned the poverty of Job, nor the health of Job, nor his friendships. Rather, literally, he turned the captivity of Job. You know, a man might be poor, sick, and friendless without being captive. But until Job had a revelation of God, until he humbled himself before God, until he brought atonement to his friends and prayed for them, he was still in captivity. And might I say, it would have been a weak restoration if God would have given back Job everything, but it still wasn't right between him and his friends, right? No, he's restored to relationship with his friends too and with his family. Did you see that in verse 11? All his brothers and all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. You know, Job was once an outcast from his own family. He talks about that in Job chapter 19 and now these relationships are restored. It's very interesting to see what it says in verse 11 that they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. And by the way, that's after his losses were restored. Think about that. It still hurt Job. You know, nobody should think that God waved a magic wand over Job and all the pain and suffering of his prior losses was taken away. No, it still wounded him. And he received beautiful consolation from his friends. I think that's wonderful. And they gave him generous gifts, a piece of silver and a ring of gold, and probably to honor his greatness. Now the end of the whole story, verse 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemina, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapach. And in all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days, happily ever after. Isn't that great in verse 12? Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. You know, at the beginning of the story of Job, we find a blessed and godly man. And at the end of the book of Job, what do we find? A more blessed and a more godly man. I love that. I love that everything Satan threw at Job, every fiery dart, every weapon of warfare, every deception, every cloud of gloom, every painful jolt through his body, everything Satan threw at him. And what's the end result? Job's more godly and more blessed at the end. Thank you, Satan. Thank you for what you accomplished in Job's life. He's more blessed and he's more godly. You know, listen, you ask yourself, why could God ever allow Job to go through such a thing as that? It's almost as if God sat in heaven and said, how can I make Job more blessed and more godly? I've got it. It'll be painful, but you know, it'll work. Job doubled his possessions under the blessing of God. By the way, he doubled his children too. If you notice the number of the camels and sheep and ox and all that, it's double what it was in the first chapter. But you say, well, why didn't he give him 20 children? We had 10 before. Well, God did give him 20 children. He had 10 in heaven and 10 on earth. He doubled everything, even the number of children that he had. And so we see here a beautiful, beautiful replacement that God did 
in Job's life, even giving him the three beautiful daughters. And then in verse 16, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. And then verse 17, Job died old and full of days. Job's life ended long and blessed. He was well rewarded as a warrior who won a great battle for God's glory. Adam Clark tells us that the idea behind that phrase, full of days, means that he died when he was satisfied with this life. He was willing to die. Adam Clark says this, the greatest, the most important purposes were accomplished by this trial. Job became a much better man than he ever was before. The dispensations of God's providence were illustrated and justified. Satan's devices were unmasked. Patience was crowned and rewarded. And the church of God greatly enriched by having bequeathed to it the vast treasury of divine truth, which is found in the book of Job. And even at the end, no solution to it all is offered to Job. No real answer for his problems, but something greater than an explanation came to him. The presence and the power and the goodness of God. I think it's appropriate. Let me, let me finish with this quote from Charles Spurgeon. We are not all like Job, but we all have Job's God. Though we have never risen to Job's wealth, nor will probably ever sink to Job's poverty, yet there is the same God above us if we be high, and the same God with his everlasting arms beneath us if we be brought low. And what the Lord did for Job, he will do for us. Not precisely in the same form, but in the same spirit and in a similar design. I believe it, because we have the God of Job. Father, thank you. Thank you for your perfect ways. Probably everyone in this room tonight, Lord, can, can relate to the experience of being at a time of questioning and wondering, God, what are you doing? And yet, Lord, at a later time, seeing your wisdom, your wonder, your power justified in all of its ways. Well, Lord, we take this from your hand gratefully. And we are so grateful. Yes, grateful for Job, but far more so are we grateful for Job's God, for you yourself who reign in heaven and love us and deal with us the same way. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us through this book. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.